Amen. Amen. All right, I derived the title of my sermon from verse number 25 here of 1 Peter chapter number 2. Focus there with me at verse number 25. The Bible reads, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. The title of the sermon this morning is The Shepherd and Bishop. The Shepherd and Bishop. Now, of course, there's been a lot of controversy over the past few weeks, yeah, even you'd say months, of the on the subject of church structure or church authority. There's a lot of people that are putting out a lot of confusion on the offices and what is supposed to take place as far as ordination, how the church is supposed to be ran, who has authority. Just from so many different aspects. And of course, I've preached a couple of different sermons on this topic. I want everyone to understand that this subject is paramount. This subject is extremely important. We got to think, Christ died for the church. He says that He built the church. He founded the church. There's a very specific structure that we should be following that is laid out in Scripture. So we need to look to the Scriptures and we need to determine, hey, this is what we should be doing, this is what we shouldn't be doing, and if we're wrong, we should make changes, right? Well, oftentimes people, you know, they get saved, they study the Bible for two, three years, the Bible says that knowledge puffeth up. And many times what they'll do is they'll start, you know, if, especially if they're not in church, they'll start conniving or conjuring up their own ideas and they automatically assume that whatever tradition is, that it's wrong, right? They automatically assume that whatever everyone else is doing, it's wrong. This is very, very common. I've seen it happen numerous times. It's very, very common and it always is the same types of people. The same types of people that are not steady in church, that have not been in church for you know, a, a consistent amount of time. They're not, they don't have stability, right? I'm sure you know the types of people that I'm talking about. There, there are numerous types of people that fall into this category. But let me say this. Tradition is not always a bad thing. Right. Tradition is not always a bad thing. And what happens is, if churches are not teaching on why things should be ran a certain way, what happens over time is people don't know why they're doing what they're doing, and then they become ignorant, and then they're more likely just to cast out what they're doing and say, well, that's just wrong. Especially if they're not informed on why they're doing what they're doing, and they don't know scripturally why. You can be passed down bad traditions. What I want to do with this church is I want to find out what the truth is and I want to pass the truth down as a tradition. Amen. Tradition is not always a bad thing. Now, I'm going to be preaching this morning on the shepherd and bishop of the church. And I'm going to be proving to you that the bishop is the pastor. The pastor is the bishop. Just like we see here, that it is a, both are titles for the same office. Both are titles for the exact same job. Just like we see here. How many people are being discussed or how many persons are being talked about in verse number 25? One person. But notice what it says. The shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now, number one, I want to begin with this. We're going to see the same thing. It's going to be very consistent, very similar to the prophets and prophesy sermon. There is, I mean, mass consistency with this. We're going to see this repeatedly. I'm going to give you, I'm going to start off first with the definition of bishop. This is the definition of bishop. This is according to, uh, uh, I think I pulled this off of Wikipedia. So it says this, or Wikipedia, a bishop, an English, uh, der an English uh, derivation from the New Testament, so derived from the New Testament of the Christian uh, Bible, Greek, and then it has the, word, the Greek word there. Overseer or guardian. So overseer or guardian is the word that's used there. And then it says this. It is an ordained, consecrated, or appointed member of the Christian clergy who is generally entrusted with a position of, of authority and oversight. So notice that this is a person that is in an office. Uh, they're a part of the Christian clergy, the officers or the people that work at the church. And then it says this, who is generally entrusted with a position of authority and oversight. The word bishop, the meaning or definition of the word bishop means overseer. That is super important. It means overseer. It actually comes from a Greek word and the Greek word is episcopus. And this Greek word comes from the word epi, the, the uh, prefix of that, of the very first part of that word epi, 
In, our, in, in English, we have the same thing like epidermic, right? That is the top layer. It's the over layer on the top of your skin, right? And then you just have the dermic. That's the middle layer. Then you have the hyperdermic, right? And what's hyper mean? Lower. So epi means above, like epicontinental. You know, th these words mean, it means up or upon or at the top. And then scopos. What do you think scopos comes from? I'm using the, the modern Greek pronunciation. No, I'm just kidding. What does scopos come from? What do you think? What word does that sound like in English? Randomly, just throw something out there. Don't be embarrassed. Scope. Epi means over. Scopos means see. Scope. You know what it means? It comes from a word, and we can even see this in the English. You don't even need to know like the Greek. You can look in, at prefixes and suffixes and root words in your own language. It means over seer. That is the literal definition and I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to see this repeatedly. It means the overseer. The one that's at the top. Like we would say supervisor. It is the overseer of the church. That is the literal definition, the exact definition of the word bishop. That's super important. Keep that in your mind moving forward. So it's the overseer, just like the word supervisor. It's a leader, right? Or it's a guide. Numbers chapter number 3, verse number 32 says this, And Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, watch this, shall be chief over the chief of the Levites. Everyone remember that verse, right? How I was talking about the, the structure is always designed for there's one person at the top, a man set over the congregation. There's many rulers oftentimes, but there's a chief over the chiefs. Now watch this. Shall be chief over the chief of the Levites, and have the oversight. Notice that. And have the oversight of them that keep the charge of the sanctuary. Notice what the chief of the chief was, the guy at the very top. He had the oversight, overseer, oversight. Comes from the exact same word. So we see that that is meaning the boss, or it is the chief. It's the guy at the top. It is the bishop. It's just another word for bishop. Now I want to focus on the word shepherd for a few minutes because there's a lot of confusion about the word Shepherd, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 2, verse number 8. We're going to look at the, the, all the mentions of pastor, pastors basically, pretty much every single one. And also we're going to look at shepherd. So there's, a, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of confusion about what a pastor is, what even the word pastor means. Now, you'll notice that I just started using the word pastor and shepherd interchangeably. And I'm going to demonstrate to you from the Bible that they are perfectly equivalent. You know what the word pastor means? It means shepherd, exactly. Exactly. They are completely synonymous. There, there is a complete... The word pastor comes from pasture, which is related to the shepherd out in the pasture feeding his flock. It literally means, and I'm going to show you this according to the Bible, pastor means shepherd. We are saying the exact same thing. And the Bible actually uses the word pastor and shepherd synonymous. So, as I said, Jeremiah chapter number 2, verse number 8, this is going to be the very first mention. We don't necessarily get a, a definition or see it used synonymous here, but I want to look at all of them quickly here. We do learn something. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 2, verse number 8. The Bible says this, The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Now, we don't get a lot of information here. One thing that we can you know, ascertain is the fact that it is speaking of spiritual leaders. Because notice there's three people that are mentioned, and who is it? It says the pastor, first it says the priest, then it says the pastors, then it says the prophets. What do all three of these have in common? They're all spiritual leaders, aren't they? So we can see that a pastor, at least here, in the first mention is being referred to as a spiritual leader. We can ascertain that. Now I want you to go over the next chapter, Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 15. <clears throat> all three of those people would have some sort of spiritual authority or they would be a spiritual leader. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 15. We learn something very interesting about a shepherd, about a pastor here. It says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Now watch this. Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So now what is knowledge and understanding when, we, when it comes to the Bible? What's the Bible referred to as knowledge and understanding? That'd be God's word, right? So notice that these people, it says, are going to be feeding Feeding others with knowledge and understanding. Keep that in mind. Go over to Jeremiah chapter number 10, verse number 21. So they're gonna be, these people are going to be teaching the word of God. They're going to be teaching. Pastors teach the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter number 10, verse number 21. Jeremiah chapter number 10, verse number 21 says this, For the pastors are become brutish. 
That means stupid. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Furthermore, watch this. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. So notice it says that the pastor's flocks shall be scattered. Now, when we read in the Bible, who has a flock all the time? When the Bible refers to a flock 99% of the time, what is it referring to? A flock of what? A flock of sheep. Just a moment ago, we saw the pastor is feeding people, right? So if we, we see here, we see the pastor is feeding something, right? And then we see that he has a flock. Just, just on surface right now, on the surface, before actually seeing them use synonymous, what would you guess a, a pastor is? A shepherd. Isn't this very simplistic, right? Okay, I want you to go now with me to, um, flip over with me to Jeremiah chapter number 50, verse number, actually, I'm sorry, no, go to Jeremiah 23. We're going to move our way forward. Jeremiah chapter number 23. We're actually going to see it here, use synonymous. Jeremiah chapter number 23, verse number 1. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 23, verse number 1. <clears throat> it says this, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Verse 2, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. So notice that the flock is what? It's God's people. And what are the pastors supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be feeding them, but what they're doing is they are destroying them and scattering them. Look at what it says next. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Saying he's going to punish them. Watch this. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and in increase. Verse 4, and I will set up, watch this, shepherds, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So did you notice what words were used synonymous or interchangeable there? First he says, hey, I'm going to get rid of these pastors, and I'm going to put new, what's he say this time? Shepherds in their place. So what is a shepherd? When it says that Jesus is the shepherd and bishop of our soul, what is it saying? It's saying he is the pastor and bishop of our soul, right? Another thing I want to point out here is I want you to look there in Jeremiah 23, specifically at verse number 4. It says this, I, and I will set up shepherds, what's that next word? Over them. So what is, where is this person located as far as leadership, as far as in the congregation? This person is over them. So he's looking down, sounds kind of like what? Kind of like a bishop, doesn't it? He's, he has the oversight. Now, let's take a quick pause and look back at the, at the portion which would be considered now the prelude because we're, we're just defining terms right now. This was, the, this was introductory. So we're going to review the definitions. Number one, the word bishop means overseer. That is the literal definition of the word. Now, the word is used... I think five times it's used um, in 1 Timothy 3 twice. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 and 2 it's used. It's used in Titus chapter 1 because we see the qualifications given in both of those locations. Then it's used in 1 Peter chapter 2 where we read. And then the other location actually, it's only one other time I believe, is in Philippians chapter number 1. Philip, where it says bishops, it's plural there, bishops and deacons. So those are the times I believe that uh, the word bishop or bishops is, is used. But I'm going to demonstrate to you from the Old Testament and New Testament that these words are actually synonymous. And a pastor means exactly the same thing. It actually just means that it is the bishop of the flock. The only reason why they are used differently is because a pastor or a shepherd is a word that is used to, to be as an analogy. And the reason why is because two reasons. Number one, it is because shepherds are supposed to lead and to guide and to rule with kindness. But not only that, they are supposed to feed the flock. And the job of the pastor, the job of the shepherd, is to teach and to preach the Word of God to the people. So these are used as titles. Both of them are used as titles. And if I were to ask you, hey, who has the oversight or who is the overseer of the sheep, what would you say? Of just sheep. If we're just speaking of like the domesticated animals, right? Not people right now as, as an analogy. What would you say? Who's the supervisor of the sheep? 
The shepherd. It's very simple, isn't it? Who's the one that is the guide or the overseer or the ruler? He sets boundaries. He, if they start to go away, he says, no, get back over here. He leads them and shows them where to eat. He leads them where to go. He tells them what to do. He doesn't just allow them to run off. He doesn't allow them to, you know, to just go their own way and do whatever they're going to do. He is the ruler of the sheep, right? All shepherd and all pastor is... It is just a title that has been taken that's used as an analogy oftentimes and is, and is it applied literally, literally uh, as a title to the ruler of the church. Now, bishop is, is also just another title that just means overseer. It's a word that just means just generally overseer. So shepherd also means overseer, but it is specific that it is the overseer of a flock. And God oftentimes uses that particular analogy. Now, you notice there that First of all, that it says that the shepherd is over them. So we saw that. It's like he has the oversight. Uh, the, the, the primary duty when having the oversight is to guide the sheep, right? Jeremiah chapter number 50, verse number 6 says this, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them, watch this, to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. So notice, he is rebuking them for not fulfilling their responsibility because what should they be doing? They should be guiding them. So what are they not doing? They are not guiding them. They are allowing them to go astray. So one of the main jobs of a shepherd or of a pastor when it comes to the oversight of the sheep is to guide them. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter number 6 verse number 7. I want you to notice this. Very important. Proverbs chapter number 6 verse number 7. Proverbs chapter number 6, verse number... Actually, let's read verse number 6, uh, uh, or the verse pr right before that as well. Verse number... Uh, Proverbs... Excuse me. Proverbs chapter number 6, verse 6 and 7. So look at verse number 6 in Proverbs 6. It says this, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Now watch this, verse number 7. Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. Now if you step back and I were to ask you, Hey, who's the guide of the sheep? You'd say what? The shepherd. If you were to step back and I were to ask you, hey, who's the overseer of the sheep? What would you say? A shepherd. Okay? Who's the ruler of the sheep? The shepherd. What does a bishop mean? He's the guide, he's the overseer, and he is the ruler. That is the definition of a bishop. That is, this is just three different perspectives of the same job or of the same man. A supervisor, what does he do? He guides them. That's his job. Hey, do this, do that. What else does he do? He, he oversees, right? What else does he do? He's the ruler. It's just three different perspectives of the same exact job. Think about this. Luke chapter number 2, verse number 8, the Christmas story, it says this. And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field. And then it says this, keeping watch over their flock by night. Watch over. What's that sound like? Maybe oversight, watch to see. Uh, I want you to turn with me now. Go to... Um, Second, actually, you go to Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 10. So we can see that it's a job of authority. They're set over. They have the oversight. They watch over. They are a guide, an overseer, a ruler. Second Chronicles uh, chapter number 18, verse number 16. I want you to notice again, two jobs are, are contrasted, right? Or are compared, actually likened to one another. Second Chronicles chapter number 18, verse number 16, it says this. Then he said... I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains that as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return therefore every man to his house in peace. So notice that the shepherd there is likened unto a master. Now, of course you don't call your pastor master. We all understand that, right? And I'm not the master of this church in the sense of the way the, the Bible uses the word master. I'm not saying that. But this is why those two jobs are, are contrasted, because they're both positions of authority. Now, specifically, he's speaking to a king here, and that's why he uses the word master. But he's, he's proving the same point. He's saying they have no leader. That's the point. Yes, a shepherd is the aspect of, of leading gently, while a master is normally the aspect of someone that leads with cruelty. Not good, right? Like God says, hey, you don't want a king because this is what he's going to do to you, right? So basically, it gives you two different aspects of what? Of leadership. It, the point still is, is that a shepherd here is likened unto a master. And the reason being is because they are both positions of authority. Isaiah chapter number 40 verse number 10, it says this, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arms shall rule for him. That's of course talking about Jesus. Notice he's ruling. 
Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And then it says this in verse 11, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Right after talking about him ruling, right? He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with him. Young. So what is the shepherd doing here? Speaking of Jesus, he's leading them. Right after it speaks of him ruling, right? So we can see that it is a position of authority. And notice again, like I said, when it talks about him being the shepherd, it's speaking about him, it says he shall gently lead them. It's speaking about a position of authority, right? The shepherd or the pastor, but it's specifically talking about a leader that is leading gently. He is not lording over them. He is still the boss. He still has the oversight. But he is leading out of love and out of sincerity. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter number 49, verse number 19. So their ruler or rule would be used interchangeable with shepherd again. Jeremiah chapter number 49, verse number 19. Again, this is about the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's still speaking about the same office so we can learn from it. Jeremiah chapter number 49, verse number 19. The Bible says this. <clears throat> Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan against the habitation of the strong. But I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? Now I want you to notice the word appoint there as well. I may appoint over her for who is like me and who will appoint me the time. And then it says this, speaking of Jesus, of course it's prophetic. And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? I want you to turn now, we're going to go to the New Testament. Go to the New Testament, to Acts chapter number 20, verse number 26. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 26. <clears throat> <clears throat> So we can see that a shepherd is someone that has the oversight. They look over the sheep. They're a guide. They're an overseer. They are a ruler. It's a man that is set over the congregation. He said that he's going to set pastors over them, right? They are in a position of leadership. They are obviously to be obeyed. He is, you know, this man is to feed the flock. It is he is supposed to feed them with what? With knowledge and understanding. Just like we talked about in, uh, in the, the sermon uh, entitled, A Man Set Over the Congregation, or Set a Man Over the Congregation. It's the exact same concept. This is a man that is set over the congregation. So it is, these two terms are perfectly equivalent. It is someone that is looking over, watching over as an overseer. We're going to see this even more so here in the next couple of verses. So that was really laying a foundation. I want you to look with me here at Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 26. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 26. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse number 26, <clears throat> Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Look at verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. So who is he speaking to right now? These are what? These would be shepherds or these would be pastors. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you, look at this, overseers. Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So notice three aspects that are spoken of while giving advice to, to uh, the same office, the same men. He's talking to all of them all at the same time and he says, hey, uh, number one, there's the flock. And you are, the Holy Ghost has made you an overseer over this flock. So they are what? And with it being an overseer, they are a bishop, right? The flock is present, so they are what? They're sheep, that means that they are the shepherd. And what are they supposed to do? All in the same sentence. They are supposed to feed the flock. So what are they? Are they a bishop or are they a shepherd? Both. They are perfectly equivalent. The, the shepherd is also an overseer, a guide, an overseer, or a ruler. Uh, keep reading there. Verse number 29 talks about the wolves coming in. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Okay, I want you to... Uh, I want you to go, so keep your hand here, slide your bulletin or whatever you, you, you have there in front of you, because we're going to turn to three different passages at the same time. So I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. I want you to go there with me right now, and then we're also going to go to the Old Testament <clears throat> in just a moment. So go to 1 Peter chapter number 5. I'm going to deal with something else in just a moment, so I'm avoiding... 
specifically or purposely I'm avoiding some verses for just a moment and then we're going to look back at these in hindsight. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 5, look at verse number 2. Look at verse number 2, it says this, Feed the flock of God which is among you. Who's it speaking to? Maybe a pastor, right? Or a shepherd, right? Feed the flock of God which is among you. Now watch this. Taking the oversight thereof. Who's he speaking to? A bishop or a pastor? Both. Why? Because it's the same guy. It's taking the oversight thereof. What does a shepherd do? He's over them. He's supposed to watch over them. What were the shepherds doing in the field? They were watching over them. A guide, an overseer, a ruler. This man is a shepherd. This man is a pastor. What was Jesus? He was called the what? The shepherd and bishop of our souls. Notice in that, in that verse 2, I didn't even point this out, but 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 2, it says, Ye were as sheep gone astray. So he's talking about you as sheep. It says, But now are returned unto the shepherd in the context of you being sheep and bishop of your souls. So notice he's the bishop of the sheep as well. Why? Because it's the same exact thing. It, he's the ruler of the sheep. So what is he? Specifically, he's a shepherd in the context of sheep. They are perfectly synonymous. So notice here, he's speaking to... The rulers of the church, obviously, number one, we can see it's shepherds, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. That's a bishop. Overseer. Look at what it says next. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Okay, now I want you to go to Numbers chapter number 27 in the Old Testament. We read this just a couple of weeks ago, but this is very, uh, very important with what we're reading right now. You'll see this consistency. Numbers chapter number 27. <clears throat> Numbers chapter number 27. Numbers chapter number 27, verse number 16. Numbers chapter number 27, verse number 16, it says this, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. Now, who did God say he was going to put over the congregation in Jeremiah 23? He said he was going to set shepherds over the congregation. You notice that? It would be pastors. Right? Actually, I believe in, you know, that was where they were used synonymous is Jeremiah 23. So he says shepherds in that verse after he had just called them pastors. So he's saying he's going to set a pastor over the congregation or he's going to set a shepherd over the congregation. In Jeremiah 23, here it says set a man over the congregation. Look at the next verse, verse 17. Which may go out before them and which may go in before them and which may lead them out. So what is this man that's over the congregation? He's leading them, right? Look at what it says next. And which may bring them in that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. So what is this man that's set over the congregation? He's a shepherd, right? He needs over the congregation. What's the definition of a bishop? The overseer. He's the lead, the leader, the guide, or the overseer, or the ruler. Keep reading. Look at verse 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. And set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. Look at verse 20. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel, it says, may be obedient. So what is he? He's a ruler. He's a ruler. This is someone that should be obeyed. He's the boss. He's the overseer. He's the ruler of the church. The guide, the overseer, or the ruler of the church. Just to prove that Moses was the previous shepherd prior to this. He was the man that was set over the congregation. Isaiah chapter number 63, verse number 11 says this. Then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Speaking of who? Moses. So who was the shepherd of the flock prior to that? It was, of course, Moses. God brought them out with the shepherd of his flock, Moses, and put his spirit within him, talking about Moses. So Moses was previously the shepherd of the sheep. That's why he makes the, state, the statement, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. And then he goes on to say that the, that the, the people be as sheep, not having a shepherd. Why? Because Moses, the current pastor of the congregation... You know, there is no difference, Old Testament, New Testament. People really get caught up in this. You know, Moses was the bishop of the church in the wilderness. He was the shepherd. He said that he was the pastor of the church. We see the Bible defining shepherd as pastor. We see the Bible using interchangeably here, speaking to the, those that have the oversight or the overseers, calling him the pastor or the shepherd as well. 
So what was Moses be as a man set over the congregation? He was the pastor of the church. He was the bishop of the church. He was who was obeyed and he fed the flock and he led them in and led them out and he taught them the word of God. Moses, obviously Moses was, was a prophet as well. He was receiving direct revelations from God. He was speaking to them the word of God. He gave them the commandments you know, in a very literal way, even more so than, you know, than I preached to you the commandments, of course, on a totally different level. He was the bishop. He was feeding the flock. He was the pastor of the church. I want you to go back to Acts chapter number 20 now. Acts chapter number 20. Go back to... Uh, actually, yeah, go, you can drop your place in Numbers 27. Keep your hand there in Acts 20 and look at 1 Peter 5 first. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter number 5 first. So let me ask you this question. One more time, verse number two, it seems very basic. And this, this I believe, is going to you know, clarify a lot of confusion when you just break it down very simply. And I'm going to explain to you why something so simple can be, has become confusing to people in just a moment. In 1 Peter chapter number five, verse number two, who is he speaking to? According to Jeremiah 23, who feeds the flock? Pastors, shepherds, right? What, it, what is their job? They have the oversight there. They are the overseer. They are what? The bishop. They're the ruler of the church. So 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 2, it says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. They are the shepherd or they are the bishop of the church. Look at verse number 1 now. Verse number 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder... And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So if we look at verse number 2, who's he speaking to? One more time. Verse number 2, who's he speaking to? Shepherds. Shepherds. These are pastors, aren't they? They are what? They are bishops. Verse number 1, what are they referred to as? They're referred to as elders. Now, I want you to notice that he uses the definite article. This is super important. Gr grammar matters when you're reading the Bible. Every word matters. He says, the elders. Now, there's been people, and I'm going to clarify this in just a moment, why, why this confusion has come about. There have been people that have tried to take the word elder and make it to mean aged man every single time. That it's just referring to an older man, right? Right here, if you were to take that interpretation of verse number one, who is he speaking to when he says the elders? He would just be speaking to all the older men in the church, wouldn't he? Right? When we look at verse number two, who is he speaking to? We know for a fact from verse number two. Who? Shepherds, pastors, and bishops, right? Then we, get, we look at, we back up. Let's see who he's addressing. The elders. We get to verse number two. We see very clear that he is speaking to pastors, shepherds, and bishops. Now, I want to ask you a couple of just very basic, simple questions. Okay? The churches at the time of the book of Acts, how many people were they running? Just on average. Hundreds. Thousands, some of them. Yay. 5,000 on, on the day of Pentecost is added to the church, right? How many, how many elderly people do you think, just, just older, I'm using the word as an aged man, do you think are in just the average churches like the church that, that 1 Peter is written to? Just, just, just by reading, we're using the Bibles that are inter our interpretation here, just by reading the book of Acts. Many, okay. So, now, when we go to 1 Timothy 3, there are specific qualifications, what are some of them? Not a novice, right? Let me give you another one. You can't be married more than one time. If you take the interpretation of verse number one, that the elders is just speaking to every older man, we get to verse number two and he is clearly speaking to bishops. You have a major problem. And this is why. Because with verse number one saying the elders in general, just addressing the church, you would have to take the interpretation that he is speaking to every older man in the church. And then furthermore, furthermore, he then speaks to them as if they are bishops and as if they are pastors, every one of them. Now, this is, this is I want to put this into perspective for you. Let's say that we had, you know, thousands of people in this church and that the word elder just meant aged man. And it was not referring to an office like a pastor or a bishop. Let's say we had thousands of people in this church. And let's say that we're going out soul winning and there are tons of people added to the church just constantly. How many older men do you think we'd have in the church that are not even close to being qualified? Tons, wouldn't we? Tons. Now if I came into a church and the word like if I, uh, the word elder just meant aged man and I said hey all the elders meet me up here who's gonna come I'm putting this into perspective for you 
Who's going to come? All the elders. If it just meant exclusively older men, who's going to come? All the older men. How many of those men are not going to be qualified? The vast majority. The vast majority of older men would not be qualified. When we look at the, the you know, the, um, specifically the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3. The vast majority. So just by trying to figure out the definition, stopping and looking at this passage, what does it see? Well, we can see without a shadow of a doubt that he's not speaking that. He says, feed the flock of God. So these people are the pastors or shepherds of the church, and their job is to feed the other people. So there, there is a distinction made from this group and the other group. And they are clearly the pastors and shepherds and bishops of the church. And then we back up to verse number 2, and he calls them what? The elders. There is no possibility. I want you to go to Acts chapter number 20. There is no way that that word could only mean aged man. I want to show you this again in Acts chapter number 20. The same thing, verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. And then he says, to feed the church of God. So what position, again, one more time, what position is this person in? They're clearly a pastor, aren't they? They're clearly in a role of leadership here. They are you know, spiritual leaders or in authority at the church. These are bishops and these are pastors. There's no way around it. Let's look at verse number 17 now. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, now watch this, and called the elders of the church. Notice that. He called the elders of the church. Now, who is he speaking to when we jump down to verse number 28? It's not that difficult. People have made it, tried to make it difficult. He's speaking to the bishops and he's speaking to the pastors or the shepherds. Once again, if... if a, if elder meant just aged man in general, and I called to a church and I said, hey, send the elders, What's gonna come? who's going to come? If it just meant aged man, who's going to come? Tons of people. Now, would it be appropriate for me when all these people are coming, just tons of older men, men that, you know, whatever line you want to try to draw where you say, hey, aged man, elderly man, right? I'm, I'm, I'm using their definition of what they would consider an older man. We could even go beyond where we know that we wouldn't because that's subjective in the first place. Where we know that we wouldn't argue, let's say, you know, 65 and up or 60 and up, right? Let's say 60 and up, all the men came. How many of those men are going to be qualified to feed the flock of God? How many of those men are going to be qualified to, you know, uh, oversee the flock of God? How often does someone in a large, large church does a man who's been in Roman Catholicism or something like that get saved and he's 60 years old? And then the very next day, if I were to walk in there and, 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 and let's say, or, or just like Paul, it says, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and it says, and called, definite article, look at this, and called the elders of the church. That means, listen to me, that means he called every elder of the church. That's the point. He called the elders of the church. Not some of them, not a elder. He called the elders of the church. And what shows up? Leadership shows up. Pastors show up. Bishops show up. And he specifically starts speaking to them as bishops and as pastors. These are the two options. That's the problem with this interpretation. If you say that elder exclusively means aged man... And Paul says that he called the elders of the church. That means that he called just the, uh, the older men in the church. But we can see very clearly who he's speaking to. There is no confusion here. He's speaking to pastors and he's speaking to bishops. And then he talks about the flock. Because they are the shepherds of the flock. Now, people, have had, you know, people may be confused about what the word elder means, but... If we reverse engineer this without, you know, with, uh, with stepping back and without looking at a definition in these particular passage, it is, it is extremely clear that he is speaking to pastors and that he is speaking to bishops, but what does he refer to them as? Elders. He says he called the elders of the church. You know what he called? He called the leadership of the church. He called the bishops of the church. He called the pastors of the church. That's why he's telling them, hey, feed the flock, shepherd. 
feed the flock, pastor. Feed the flock, bishop. Go to, I want you to go with me now, go to Titus chapter number 1. <clears throat> Actually, go over to Acts chapter 14 first. Go to Acts chapter, since we're in the book of Acts, go to Acts chapter number 14. Acts chapter number 14, verse number 23. <clears throat> Look at verse 22 first, just to read both these verses together. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, this is Paul doing this, and that we, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 23. It says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. I want you to go with me now to Titus chapter number 1. So it says that they ordained elders in every church. Go to Titus chapter number 1. <clears throat> Titus chapter number 1. <clears throat> Titus chapter number 1. Look at verse number 7. <clears throat> it says, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. So we can see a list of qualifications that are given, and it tells you specifically who they are given to. What does it say? It says, for a bishop must be blameless, okay? Well, I want you to back up, go back to verse number 4. Go back to verse number 4. So it's speaking about what right now? A bishop. 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 2 is speaking to who? Speaking to bishops. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 27, 28, right around there was speaking to who? Speaking to bishops, pastors, bishops. But what did he call, who did he call to meet him? It says, the elders. And then he starts speaking to who? The bishops. So we can see these terms are very clearly being used synonymous. I want you to look here at verse number 4. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. And then he says, And ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. And then he tells us in verse number 7, For a bishop must be blameless. Now I believe by comparing the first couple of verses that we looked at that it is extremely obvious in 1 Peter 5 and Acts chapter number 20 that he is specifically speaking to bishops and shepherds. Then we back up because the elder is the verse that is, that is, being, that is in question, right? That's, that's the, the passage or the sp specific word that people are trying to say, hey, this always means aged man, right? This always means that he's an older man. Then we back up and we see another title being used after we can see clearly that he is referring to a shepherd and a bishop. It says the elders that are among you. Now, is he speaking to just every older man, or was he specifically speaking to the leaders in the church? Specifically the leaders, right? We look at Acts chapter number 20, what do we see? Specifically the leaders. Right here, what does it say that you are to ordain? It says that you are to ordain elders in every city. And then he says right after that, for a bishop must be blameless. They are clearly being used interchangeable, even in this chapter or this passage alone. You look at Acts chapter 14, what does it say? It says that they ordained elders in every city. Notice it doesn't tell you the office if you just limit the verses to, if you, I'm sorry, if you limit the titles to bishop and pastor. It just tells you they ordained elders in every city. What were they ordained as? In what kind of office were they ordained as? If, if elder is not an office, or elder is not a, a name of an office, what is he... Now let me ask you this question. What is Titus ordaining? What office is Titus ordaining them into here? Bishops. And you know what he says? Ordain elders in every city. And then he goes on and says, for a bishop must be blameless. First Peter 5, he's speaking to bishops. But he says, hey, 
the elders. That is a title. Acts chapter number 20. What does he say? You know, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight. He's speaking to a bishop. He's speaking to a shepherd. But who did he call? Tell the elders to meet me there. Did a bunch of just old men show up? No. Specifically pastors. Specifically bishops. And he starts giving advice and he starts giving admonishment specifically to bishops and pastors. Now, if you, this is the problem. Even if, outside of all of that, even if you try to just stop and apply this, apply this to just every old man, because that's what you'd have to say. The definite article is used every time. It makes zero sense. The elders which are among you, I exhort, which am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Then what does he say? Feed the flock of God which is among you. You know what an elder does? He does the job of a shepherd. You know what an elder does? He just does the job of a bishop. Bishop, shepherd, and elder. When, when anyone is speaking to an elder, they're speaking to a bishop every time in the Bible. Think about that. And you expect me to believe that every, you would have to literally, because the definite article is used two different times. You'd have to literally say that every old man. That's the only way that you, there's no, there's no other interpretation. You can try to think your way out of it. There's not. He said that he called for the elders of the church. That would mean that every single old man that came in that church, that every old man in that church is a pastor and is a bishop and every one of them are qualified. That's the only interpretation. The elders. Grammar matters. Definite article. That means every one of them. Called for the elders of the church. If we had a bunch of older men in this church and I said, you know, stand up, you know, I want all of the elders, and I meant that as an aged man, all of the elders to stand up. You know how many of them would stand up? If I'm speaking of aged men, if it exclusively meant aged man, every one of them. Every one of them. That's, these are your only two options. They're your only two options. How many just older men are qualified for it to be a bishop or a pastor? Very, very few. That interpretation cannot work. It cannot. It does not work and it cannot work. This is, you'd have to, you have to, when you, when you, what you have to do is you have to play devil's advocate. And I tried to work this out. I even started, and I'll tell you why, I even started to, to uh, uh, reinterpret, try to reinterpret some verses and it doesn't work. It, 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 they won't fit. It doesn't work. You have to play devil's advocate and hold the feet to the fire and you have to try to interpret these verses the way exactly that they're written with that type of uh, definition. Now, the reason why people are confused about this is just because it ha words in the Bible many, many times have, will have a couple of different meanings. They will be used in different ways, right? Think of, I mean, we could, people could just scream stuff out right now. I'll give you a couple examples. The word Lord. The word Lord refers to what? God. But then it also just means sir or boss in the Bible. Think about the word heaven or heavens. The word heaven can refer to just like the sky, where the birds fly, you know. Uh, or it can refer to literally like God's dwelling place. You know, there's a, a vast difference between those two different things. Vast. It's, the Bible refers to heaven where God dwells as being a different world. It actually uses the word, word world. There is a vast difference. You can look at so many words in the Bible. Tons of different words in the Bible, and you can very clearly prove without a shadow of doubt that they are being used totally different. That they are being used in a very different way. So sometimes what people will do is they will, tr they will find where a word is being defined you know, as something, at, in some way, and then they will take that exact definition and they'll apply it to every single time it's used. Like the word God. The word God sometimes can be referring to a false god. The word God sometimes in the Bible is also referring to just a ruler, just like the word Lord does. The word God also can refer to God. But if you tried to take the definition of just God referring to the Lord our God and apply that every single time, do you know how messed up you would be when you're reading the Bible? Horribly messed up. You wouldn't have a clue you know, if you just strictly applied that every single time. You know, I didn't include this because this wasn't meant to be the majority of this sermon. But look up the word elder and elders and probably 50% of the time it's speaking of rulers. You know who, it, who they're found in a list with? El he called the elders, the heads of the tribes, 
and you know the uh, the the priest, and it'll go on a and the officers. He called the elders and the and the chief priests. He called the elders and you know the the officers just over and over again. Is he just calling just the old men? Hey, all the old men, come over here. We got a big decision to make. That's not who, what he's doing. That's ridiculous. Do you know how many? You know the Bible talks about how you know a hoary head is a crown of righteousness. But you know what it says next? If if it be found, I'm sorry, it's a crown of honor. If it be found in the way of righteousness. Not every old man has honor. There's a lot of old fools out there today who are, who are, who are drunkards and know nothing about this book. And guess what? If they get saved tomorrow, they're not in the leadership of this church. They're not making decisions in this church. They've been a Pentecostal pastor for 50 years and then they get saved and then they come into the church and Paul's like, hey, all the elders, feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof. You're out of your stinking mind. That is not what an elder is. It's very simple. Hey, hey, come over here, elders. I need you to feed the flock of God. I need you to have the oversight thereof. What am I talking about? It, it's that simple. I'm talking about a shepherd. I'm talking about a pastor. I'm talking about a bishop. Amen. It's super clear. Hey, ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And then what does he say? For a bishop must be blameless. It tells you they ordained elders... And then they left. It doesn't tell you a position. If, you, if, if they just ordained old men, come on. They're ordaining, you know what it's saying? They ordained rulers. They ordained overseers. They ordained leadership. They ordained bosses. They ordained bishops. That's what it's saying. These are just different words that are being used to speak of the leadership. Like I said, I tried to back up and, 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 and I tried to reinterpret some of these verses this way. Hey, sometimes it's talking about older men, but it's not always. And you can't use that interpretation every single time. So what people do is they have this simplistic understanding of the Bible. And hey, sometimes, yeah, you can use the Bible to define the Bible. And, and that definition sometimes may carry all the way through the Bible. But there are many words that have multiple definitions of the word. And it's not the same meaning every single time. And you'll find that if you try to use that meaning every single time the word comes up, you'll put yourself in a total mess. And it makes zero sense. And it's just, it'll make a mess of the Bible. I want you to turn with me now to, uh, go with me to Hebrews chapter number 13. <clears throat> now, one of the other things is I've heard people say, you know, so pastor can't be synonymous with bishop, even though we saw very clearly that it is over and over again. They both take the oversight thereof. They're both the overseer. They're put over the congregation, set a man over the congregation. We saw Joshua was obviously the ruler. They were obeying him. He was the shepherd. He was the pastor. They, they both are guide, overseer, ruler. It's just, it's one office, an office of a man that's the guide, the overseer, and the ruler. And he's called the bishop as a title, but then also he's called a shepherd or a pastor because the shepherd or the pastor is the boss of the sheep. That's all that it means. They're just different titles, right? And I've heard people say that, hey, a pastor is not perfectly synonymous with a bishop because Jeremiah is called a pastor, right? Jeremiah is called a pastor and Jeremiah was not married. And what's a qualification for a bishop? He has to be what? He has to write. He has to be the husband of one wife, right? So, you know, they'll say, see, that means that they can't be perfectly synonymous. Now, has anyone ever heard of the, term, of the phrase, the exception proves the rule? Does everyone understand what that actually means? The exception proves the rule. So, the fact that you find something and it's an exception proves that there is a rule. A lot of people don't understand what it actually means. So, because there is an exception, that doesn't disprove the rule. That proves that there is a rule. Because in almost every area of life, there are rules, but there are exceptions to those rules. And do you know what this is? This is an exception that actually is proving the rule. Why is Jeremiah able to do this? Be exactly. Read Jeremiah 1 and maybe you'll figure it out. He was appointed before I knew thee, before, before, you know, before thou, it was in the, you know, his mother's belly, I can't remember it now, uh, I ordained thee uh, a prophet amongst the nations, basically, right? You know, he, he, he chose, he handpicked Jeremiah to be a prophet 
and to be a pastor or shepherd to the nation of Israel. God handpicked him. I want you to think about it. He ordained him. That's why Jeremiah is an exception to this. And he was sent forth to be a shepherd or a pastor, and he was a prophet. Now, 1 Timothy 3 is meant to be guidelines for us as, as humans and as man, for us to use those guidelines and to prove men by. Do you understand? It's, it's, meant, so it's meant to be you know, a precaution, basically. So we have these guidelines to help us to make sure that we can get the perfect man or the or man that is qualified for this position into that office. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? But does that mean, I want you to think about this for just a minute, does that mean that it's possible that if a man does not have any children that he couldn't be a great pastor? It would, wouldn't you agree that Jeremiah probably was a good pastor? Right? He was, right? Now, would you be able to tell? Or do you think it's probably a better idea that God says, hey, just in case, because you're going to be the one proving, not me. God obviously knows. God knows, hey, that guy might, might not have a family, might not have kids, but Jeremiah, he, he's still going to be a pastor, and he'll be a good pastor. Right? God knows these things. But does man, can man just say? Of course not. Do you know what God does? The whole purpose of 1 Timothy chapter 3 is for, is for man to have guidelines. To say, hey, if they meet these qualifications, they could for sure be a good pastor for you. They could for sure be a good bishop for you. That's the purpose of 1 Timothy 3. Right? Let me ask you this question. Was Jesus married? Jesus was a shepherd and he was a bishop. Was he a good now, well, I mean, there's a verse you could quote there. Was he a good shepherd, right? He did say, I'm a good shepherd, right? Amen. So, did he have children? So, there are people that could be a great pastor that are out there. But let me say, we will never ordain that person, ever. Because I don't know. I'm not God. But God knew that Jeremiah would be a good pastor. He would be a good shepherd. When you look at the order of the authority in the church, you know how it goes? Apostles prophets, and then it says pastors, teachers, right? Are, are prophets pastors? Think about that. What was Jeremiah? He was. He was a shepherd to the sheep, wasn't he? Apostles and prophets are not just usual people. They're not just normal people. They are special rulership in the church. What is a, a bishop? He's an overseer or a ruler, right? So they would be like special pastors or special bishops or special rulers in the church. But you know what's after that? Just plain old pastors. Just plain old pastors. Do you know what a pastor is? Do you know what a shepherd is? He's a bishop. So these would be just a normal bishop that are not, you understand? Prophets. If they're just a pastor, they are not a prophet and they are not an apostle. When the apostles came to the churches, they had great authority even over the bishops that were there. They were given this great authority because it's apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, pastors, yes, prophets could be pastors, apostles could be pastors, but there are pastors that aren't prophets. And when God chooses a prophet to be a pastor, He handpicked that man. And he can, the exception actually proves the rule. You know, it is extremely clear in all those passages we looked at that when he's like, hey, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. What is a bishop? He's an overseer. What's the job of a bishop? To be the ruler. What was Jesus called? He's the shepherd and bishop of our souls. It's the same office. It's the exact same office. Shepherd, pastor, are used interchangeable. What does it say? Hey, set a man over the congregation. He says, that the people be not as sheep not having a shepherd. And he says, take some of thine honor and put it upon Joshua that they may what? Obey him or be obedient to him. He's the ruler of the church. He's the bishop or the pastor of the church. I'm going to further prove this to you. Did you turn to Hebrews 13 already? Okay, I'm going to read to you from 1 Thessalonians 5.12. Just further proof that there is authority and leadership. Listen, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. What does it mean to admonish? It's verbal correction, right? Or verbal teaching. 
What, is it, what are they doing? They're feeding the flock of God. They're preaching the word of God to you, and it says they are over you. What are they? The same person that's over you is the same person that's admonishing you. It's the ruler, the overseer, and he's the shepherd. He's feeding the flock of God. Uh, I want you to look here at a couple of passages. Hebrews chapter number 13. Look at verse number 7 first. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 7. It says this, Remember them which have the rule over you, watch again, who have spoken unto you the word of God. What does the shepherd do? He feeds the flock with knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Notice the person that has rule over you is speaking to you the word of God. Bishop, shepherd, or overseer, watching over the flock. Keep that in mind. Look down at verse number 17. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, watch this, for they watch for, no, I'm sorry, for they watch for your souls. What are they doing? They're an overseer. What were the shepherds doing? Keeping watch over their flock by night. Their guide, overseer, ruler. It says, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Look at verse number 24 now too. Verse number 24. <clears throat> Salute all them that have the rule over you. And then he says this, and all the saints. So notice there's a difference in leadership and the saints. Notice there are people that have the rule over you. What do they do? They admonish you. What do they do? They teach you the word of God. They feed you. They feed the flock. They watch over your souls. What does the shepherd do? He watches over the flock. They are perfectly synonymous. Jesus was the bishop of the sheep. He was the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherd and bishop of your souls. The elder, it's just another term. The elders of the church is not just speaking about just the old people of the church. No, it's the elders that feed the flock of God. It's the elders that watch over them and take the oversight thereof. Watching over the rest of the flock. You know, you know it's, it's a position of leadership. That is what an elder is. That is what a bishop is. That is what a shepherd is. There aren't other positions in the church. There are two legitimate offices in the New Testament church. We're given qualifications for them in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. A bishop and a deacon. That's it. There isn't, there, there's not all these other offices like, yeah, but then there's this other office, the pastor, that has no qualifications and I can just step into that office anytime I want. Think about that. Well, why doesn't everybody just strive to be a pastor then if there's no qualifications for it? Think about that. You know? And, and why is it that the pastor's doing the same thing the bishop's doing? What in the world's the bishop do then? It's ridiculous. It really is. What does the bishop do then? You know, it makes zero sense. The shepherd or the pastor is, it's another word for the bishop. The shepherd and bishop of your soul. It's the man that rules over. It's the man that teaches the word of God. Numbers 27, I'm going to end on this real quick. Numbers 27 says to set a man over the congregation. That man is to be the bishop and he is to be the shepherd of your souls. He is to take the oversight thereof. He is to protect. He's got to give an account. You know, it's the people that, like it says in the New Testament, you know, uh, uh, those that are over you in the Lord and admonish you, those that speak to you the word of God. That's why the bishop has to rule his house well because his job is to come in and rule and take oversight. Pastors are over people. They have authority. And you expect me to believe that there's no qualifications for a pastor? Even though, even though God said, I'm going to set shepherds over you. Even though Joshua was called a shepherd. He was called a pastor. Wasn't he? And he's a man set over the congregation. No qualifications. Just step right in. Go ahead and just preach the word of God to everybody. There's a reason why they have to give an account. You don't just willy-nilly get behind the pulpit. I've been saved for a week. Let me preach a new doctrine to you. Yeah, then you come up with crap like this. Right. This ridiculous interpretation. Hey, everything in the New Testament church isn't wrong. We don't need to reinvent Christianity, Joseph Smith. Right. We just study the Bible and we can see, hey, a lot of traditions that I were given was right. But when you approach the Bible with a rebellious, just, you know, anti-authority type of attitude... And that's what all of that is about. Yep. All of it, every aspect of it. Hey, I should be able to preach it. Nobody should be able to tell me not to. Right. Everybody should get up here. It's they want their voice to be heard. Right. That's all that it is. There, is a, there are qualifications. And then they want to try to invent this other, this other office 
the, uh, with, which has authority, but they act like there's no authority in the church. And then it just so happens that this person is in that position of the pastor. Do you know what they're doing? They're sidestepping the qualifications. They're starting up their own church. They're putting themselves in the position and doing exactly what the bishop and pastor does. Right. That's exactly what's going on. There's no difference. That's exactly what's going on. The Bible does not teach a democracy. The Bible does not teach a board of deacons. The Bible teaches that there are elders, there are rulers, there are bishops, and there are shepherds. And they give an account. Set a man over the congregation. We get to the New Testament, it talks about rulers, it talks about bishops, it talks about elders. People try to say, well, in the New Testament, that means there must be multiple elders, there must be multiple rulers, there must be multiple you know, uh, uh, shepherds or pastors, and there's not one man. Numbers 27 is Moses giving a general truth. And he says, set a man over the congregation that the people be not as sheep not having a shepherd. Reality doesn't just change when the new covenant comes in. That's a general truth that's needed. And you know what will happen if there's not a man, a single man at the top, ruling and making decisions? You need a chief of the chiefs that's taking the oversight, just like Eleazar. You need someone that's over, the, that's over the top making the decisions. And this man has to rule. And you know what he's going to have to do? He's going to have to give an account. And he has to make the decisions. So when we get to the New Testament, I want you to think about this for a minute. Are we ever told not to set a man over the congregation? Are we ever told that there shouldn't be a head pastor? In the New Testament, what is clearly taking place? There's a, there's a lead always. There's a chief of the chiefs in the house of God. How many judges at a time? And what is the job of the judge? He's the man over the congregation, isn't he? Joshua was the judge. Samuel was the judge. He's over the prophets, it tells you. Samuel was. All the prophets. He was the boss of all the prophets. Moses was the shepherd of the flock, it says. One man was the shepherd of the flock. Then he goes to God. He's like, hey, I need some help. And he's going to say, okay, well, I'm going to bump you down and add all these other 70 elders. Nope. He says, okay, you're the shepherd of the flock up here at the top. Then we're going to add these other 70 elders. They deal with the small matters. If there's anything that they can't do, can't handle, they're going to come to you. And then Moses is dying. He says, set a man over the congregation. What does he do? Joshua. And he's at the top. Set a man over the congregation. Has that ever canceled? Is that ever negated? Ever? Church existed in the Old Testament, right? Church exists in the New Testament, right? Moses is giving a general truth, okay? It's kind of like this. I'll give you an analogy. The Old Testament tells us to use instruments, right? doesn't it? We use instruments all the time, right? Is that repeated specifically in the New Testament? Does that mean no instruments? You know, we don't toss out everything in the Old Testament if it's not repeated, right? Does the, does the Bible specifically say, you know, that you shouldn't kidnap in the New Testament? Does that mean you should go snag some kids in the New Testament? Do you understand? We don't need things to be repeated in order for them to still stand in the New Testament. This should be your, your, you know, your interpretation of the Bible. Think about this. If something is not clearly canceled in the New Testament, it's still active. Amen. That's how we should treat the laws of God. That's how we should treat everything. And, and, and even on top of that, we can see that this is just a general truth of just how things work. Set a man over the congregation that the people be not as sheep, not having a shepherd. You know what happens if you don't set a man over the congregation? Then they're going to be as sheep, not having a shepherd. There needs to be a man at the top that is the chief of the chiefs. And what does he do? Takes the oversight. That man is the shepherd and he is the bishop. And when addressing the shepherds and bishops, what does he say? Hey, the elders that are among you, I exhort. They ordain elders in every city. Those are rulers. Those are bishops. It's not just old men. That's a stupid interpretation. The more you sit down and just think about it, you know, I tried to entertain the idea with an honest heart. It's retarded. You know, people hate that word, but guess what? It's retarded. It's stupid. It makes no sense. Just all the old men. They come in, just sit down, take the, you know, feed the flock of God who's among you, taking the oversight thereof. Just because they're old, they have these qualifications. Yeah, if it be found in the way of righteousness. That's why 1 Timothy 3, which is the most detailed account of the qualifications, mentions nothing about an old man. You know what it says? If any, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Amen. If any man, any man. You know what it says? Hey, here are the qualifications. You meet these, you can be a bishop. Not a novice. Having faithful children. 
Not accused of riot or unruly. And then it goes on and on and on. If any man... You know, people discover something in the Bible, and when they don't have a church that, that you know... Because being in a church... I learned some good stuff from, you know, this crazy guy I used to go to his church. Being in a church keeps you normal, right? Has any people here heard that? That's true. That is true. That is very true. Because when you start to come up with some stupid idea and you start talking about it, people will be like, well, you know what will happen is you'll be bombarded with scriptures that will refute what you're saying. And they'll start explaining to you, hey, that passage, well, if you take that interpretation, then that means this, this, and this. And people, you'll get all of these iron sharpeneth iron. But if you get out on your own and you start trying to, you know, study the Bible, and, and of course you should study the Bible on your own. I'm saying without a church, without fellowship, we're commanded to go to church. Yeah. You know, without iron sharpening iron, you're going to come up with some wacky, crazy ideas, and there's nobody to say, that is retarded, right? You need me to say sometimes, that is retarded. That is stupid. You know? You know why people get offended by that language? You know, we live in just like this. Just everyone is just so stinking sensitive. When I was stupid, my dad would tell me I was stupid when I was younger. You're being stupid. You're being an idiot. Would you would say that to me? He said yes, yes. <laughs> you know what I realized? I'm being stupid. I need to stop being stupid. I need to stop being an idiot. I need to stop being retarded sometimes. When you're being a fool, you need someone to tell you, stop being a fool. Amen. That's what you need. You need someone to, 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 to sternly say, that is dumb. What you're saying is foolish. There's two things in the Bible for correction, reproof and rebuke. Not just reproof. Rebuke is a strong correction. And you know what Jesus will say sometimes? Thou fools. You know what that means? Well, you know what he called the pastors? The pastors are become brutish. You know what brutish means? Stupid. Idiots. The, he's saying the pastors are become idiots. It's the same thing. That's idiotic. The pastors are become stupid. That's what that means. They're fools. They're dumb. You know, and you know why people get so offended by this? It's because it hits home. Because they know when they've been corrected, and then they hear that, they're like, he just called me an idiot. If it wasn't true, they wouldn't care. If, I, if they were totally right, they wouldn't mind. But you know what? There are many times when people have called me a fool and an idiot, and, and it was the right time, and you know what? They should have. And you know what it does? It makes you want to fix it. Yeah. When, some, when you have the right heart, and you say something dumb, and somebody's like, that's stupid. It stings a little bit, but you know what you should do? You shouldn't get mad. Why are you calling me names? Don't call me that. You know what you should do? You should fix the problem. Amen. Do you think the right attitude for Cleopas and his buddy on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus is like, thou fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophet spoken. He's like, why are you calling me names? You think that's the right attitude? Think about it. It's the same thing. If you're stupid, just say, you know what, I was stupid. I did something dumb. What I said was, was dumb. It was, I mean, you know what? I'm being an idiot. Right? I'm being an idiot. Fix it. Fix the problem. Stop being, you know, we need to not be sensitive. Name calling is biblical, man. <clears throat> All throughout the Bible, I mean, he's like, God's like addressing Israel through the prophet. The prophet's standing there. He's like, you know, you're a bunch of whores and harlots. You're disgusting. Like, he just goes off. Just name after name after name after name. And if you are, I want you to think about this. If you read some of those passages, like in the book of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, where they are just going off, I want you to imagine seeing, you know, a man in a rough garment, a prophet, standing out in the middle of just hundreds of people. You know, and he's just, just yelling all of this at him. You're like a, a whore, a nasty whore, just saying all the, I'm, you know, obviously updating the language, right? But just going off, calling them harlots and whores. And just, just, what is that? It's devaluing them. And what people say, you're stupid, you're hurting feelings, you devalue them. What do you think that is? If, you're, if that's what you're being, then that's what you need to be called. You know? Amen. That's the preacher's job. And people sometimes get mad at the preacher. And it's because that there's authority and there's, rule, and there's, a, there's rulership there. Amen. And it's a big job. And it's account. And you know what? If you say something you shouldn't say as a pastor, you should admit it. So that's why you do need to be careful about things that you preach and say. You need to think about what you're, you know, what you're saying before you say it if anyone you know, wants to be a pastor. You know, 
A pastor is another word for a shepherd. The shepherd is the bishop of the sheep. They're synonymous. Do you know what else they're called? The elders. He called the elders. You know what he called? He called the shepherd and the bishops. They ordain elders, but it just doesn't tell you the office. There's two offices. A bishop or deacon. That's it. That's it. And it's, the, it's not the deacon's job to feed the flock. When you read, the deacon's job is just to wait tables and serve. You know what the bishop's job was? When he called the elders, he wasn't calling the deacons. He wasn't. Because their job is not to feed the flock of God. The whole purpose they hired the deacons in Acts 6 was because, hey, we can't leave the word of God and serve tables. That's what you're going to do. So we're going to preach the word of God. We're going to teach the word of God. We need someone else that can serve. So you know what he called when he called the elders? He called the bishops and he called the shepherds. That's who he called. One in the same office, just like Jesus Christ is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. <clears throat> we thank you, dear God, for 